Pleasure today to introduce Professor David Curtis, who's given us possibly one of the most boring seminar titles I've ever heard, but I promise you it's going to be a cracking talk. David, very, very quickly, David is a haematologist and bone marrow transplant physician. Um, he qualified in mid-90s? 94. 94. He came to Weehi. He did a PhD with Glenn Begley in the cancer division, uh, good old days. Then went to David Bodine yes. um, at NIH and came back 10 years ago or so to start his own lab. He worked at the Bone Marrow Research Labs for a long time and recently moved to the Australian Centre for Blood Diseases, which is at the Monash AMRAP campus, um, where he continues to do work on red cells, epigenetics, leukaemia, uh, et cetera. And uh, over to you, David, welcome. Thank you, Ben. So, uh, I apologise for the boring title. <laughs> Can't be as exciting as uh, Terry and <laughs> T. Lee. Anyway. Uh, although I did get to meet the Prime Minister last week, just before he didn't give me my grant. This is the dark side over here, there's really behind this. <laughs> I did decide not to uh, return to Lehi or Lehi didn't want me or something like that. Uh, and this is the ACVD, uh, Alfred Hospital, and our labs are uh, located here next to the Baker and the Burning. Um, so, and this is uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I was wondering what to talk about because we do, uh, as Ben said, quite a few different things uh, working with chemia, genetics. Um, but uh, we've had a long term uh, collaboration with Ben and Doug. Uh, with uh, EMU Genesis, and so that's, we sort of get in their slops. Um, <laughs> and so the red cells come to us, and so I'm going to talk about two of the red cell mutants, which I think are, uh, are really interesting and has uh, uh, made potential um, uh, relevance to, to a number of different diseases, malaria, sickle cell disease, etc. So the, all of the work uh, was performed by um, a fantastic PhD student who's just uh, finished, uh, Fiona uh, Brown, uh, who is looking for a postdoc, and I would highly recommend her. Um, and this is uh, in collaboration with Steve Jane, uh, and Loretta uh, has been an RA with Steve for about 30 years, so uh, something's, uh, something's obviously right. So, this is the uh, mutagenesis screen. You've probably seen pictures like this uh, a million times before, but essentially this is uh, the uh, EMU mutagenesis of a male, uh, bred with a female to generate uh, offspring, so the G1s, um, and each gamete will have about 50 mutations with the EMU mutagenesis. And so the, the screen was a blood count at seven weeks, really easy, uh, and all the isolated red cell mutants um, uh, that Ben and Doug have uh, isolated have been handed over to us. And I'll show you a, a sort of a, a table of uh, the different mutants. Um, so that's the screen. And then um, one important thing is to confirm Mendelian inheritance. So we have had a number of uh, mice that have been handed over which actually didn't turn out to be easily um, um, segregated into uh, a dominant um, um, mutant. So um, uh, the mutant mice are, are bred with uh, wild type mice, and you expect a 50 50 uh, mix. So, um, we see this mutagenesis program uh, as a way of identifying uh, new regulators of erythropoiesis. So, genes are already known, but not known to be important for erythropoiesis. Um, it will almost certainly identify functional domains of known genes, uh, which would potentially be drug targets, and as well. Uh, it's a really nice way of generating mouse models of human disease. And hopefully I'll show you um, um, data which really supports uh, the reason why we've uh, pursued this um, um, thing. Now, there are a couple of problems with it. One that um, sort of has uh, been overcome is mutation detection um, with whole genome sequencing. And one of the other major problems which we still uh, don't really understand is we get recurrent mutations in the same gene. Um, and it seems to be strain specific. So, um, black 6 or valve C get um, mutations for transparent receptor, we don't know why, uh, as where SJL doesn't. Uh, so, um, with regards to the mutation detection, um, 
it's really changed over the last three or four years uh, with whole genome sequencing. So previously, uh, we would do uh, mapping crosses, so to identify SMPs, uh, SNPs, um, and try and localize the region. And then uh, within that interval, there'd be a number of candidate genes that we'd go through sequencing them. And really, I guess uh, that's what Ben and, uh, and Warren have really um, uh, did traditionally, and, and as they would know, is, is a painstaking effort, which uh, often um, is very, very difficult because there may be large numbers of genes within that uh, mapped region. Um, more recently, uh, and the two examples that I'm going to talk about today, uh, we've mapped to a specific uh, chromosome and then done custom capture. Uh, and either if the, if the region is relatively small, we've done whole genome sequencing or exomic sequencing if it's a, a large, and I'll show you an example of each of those. Uh, and this year, we've uh, started to do uh, um, mutation detection by just whole genome sequencing of, uh, of the whole genome. And we've uh, uh, now done two more mutants um, and identified the mutation within about four months of actually uh, starting the project. Uh, so it's now become an honours project basically uh, for, for honours students. We give them a red cell mutant and they characterise the phenotype and identify the mutation, which is uh, really a long way. Um, um, beyond uh, this sort of method, which used to take one to three years uh, to actually identify the mutant. So this is the uh, autosomal uh, dominant red cell mutants uh, that we've identified. Uh, most of them have been microcytic, uh, predominantly because uh, most of them are within valve C or black 6. And as you can see, whoops, as you can see, um, the most common recurrent mutation is one's of uh, transferrin receptor. So we've identified six different uh, independent ones where there's been a mutation of the transferrin receptor. Um, so these are all identified by a reduced MCV. So a, a normal MCV uh, is around about 45, uh, and you can see that there's uh, small red cells. Um, and you can see that the homozygotes, uh, some of them are viable, as where others are embryonic lethal at either uh, <coughs> during hematopoietic development or even before the hematopoietic development. And these are the genes that we've identified, Ancrin, uh, as well as transferrin CF3, which was uh, a gene not known to regulate um, iron metabolism. And uh, about three months before we identified the mutation, it was published in, in Nature Genetics. So we got scooped for that one, and we're still waiting to find that, uh, that holy grail of a gene that nobody knew about that's important in human disease. Uh, and uh, maybe one of them that I'm going to describe today is one of those. Um, beta globin, so models of thalassemia, uh, and we've got one mutant which we haven't worked on because uh, we don't have the one to do it on uh, CPOX, which uh, uh, causes human uh, porphyria. Um, interestingly, the, we've got only identified two macrocytic lines uh, and um, uh, there are a number of other macrocytic lines which we've got from Macquarie uh, University from Simon Foot. Um, and for some reason in the SJL, they tend to have a macrocytic uh, red cell phenotype. And here's an example one which uh, was identified as the retinoblastoma like uh, one gene. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about two mutants. I'll make sure that I'm running on time. Okay. Uh, the first is RBC12, which is um, a heterozygous state, is a microcytic anemia. Um, and if you uh, look at the red cell parameters, they're mildly anemic uh, and have small uh, red cells, which are hyperchromic. And these are the blood film, uh, which is sort of the first thing that they do to try and give us an idea of the causes of, the, of potential microcytosis. And there's really the blood film in this strain is pretty unremarkable. There are um, a few target cells uh, and a few other sort of irregular cells, but really didn't tell us much about <coughs> potential uh, mutations. So this was mapped, um, uh, this was about three years ago now, uh, to a region uh, of about seven megabases, and it contained 194 candidate genes. So uh, we weren't about to go sequencing every one of those. Um, so when we, uh, when the the facility for exome capture uh, became available, we, we did exome capture and sequencing. And the mutation of RBC12 is a T to G substitution in a gene called Dynamin2. Uh, 
uh, and here is the electrochromatogram uh, just showing the heterozygous state with the uh, <coughs> mutation. This mutation does not affect um, RNA expression, so this is real-time PCR, uh, but it does appear to express uh, ex affect protein expression, so it's about 50%. Bandura. Oh, at Bandura. Sorry, Bandura. <laughs> I apologise. <laughs> um, so there is about 50% uh, reduced expression of dynamins, suggesting that maybe this mutation um, affects protein stability and, and it's just a heterozygous uh, um, state. Um, however, um, it's not uh, due to just loss or heterozygosity because when you take the dynamin uh, knockout mice, uh, which is embryonic lethal um, before day uh, e uh, seven, um, and look at the heterozygous, the blood uh, count, uh, you can see that there is uh, essentially no anemia and no microcytosis. So we don't think, uh, just based on this, that this is just due to uh, heterozygosity of the uh, dynamin two. And I'll show you data that uh, suggests that it's acting as a dominant negative. <clears throat> So what is Dynamin 2? It's a large GTPase uh, protein, and its main function is uh, that it's required for endocytosis. Here's the, uh, the domain structure of uh, Dynamin 2 with the uh, mutation of V235G, uh, which occurs within the GTP um, GTPase. Um, so Dynamin 2 uh, is predominantly, or one of its main effects is uh, or functions is, uh, is in um, clathrin-mediated endocytosis. So here you have uh, either a receptor tyrosine kinase or transferrin uh, receptor, which is of relevance to this phenotype. Um, and you get um, coating with clathrin, followed by the formation of this vesicle, and here's dynamin here wrapping itself around the stalk of the, end, uh, of the endosome, and that uh, then clips off. And what's critical for the clipping from here to here is the G GTPA's uh, activity. Uh, Dynamin is also important for uh, non-clathrin mediated uh, or caviolin uh, mediated uh, endocytosis, which is important for um, the endocytosis of small uh, molecules such as folate, albumin, uh, nitrogen oxide. Um, but it also has other functions, particularly for actin uh, cytoskeleton um, um, effects. So this is the mutation uh, within the structure um, of Dynamin 2, uh, and this is uh, GTP. So it lies very close to the um, uh, GTP binding domain, uh, <coughs> suggesting that maybe it's a GTPase dead uh, mutant of, of Dynamin 2. And indeed, that's, that's what it is. Um, of relevance is that um, about a year ago or 18 months ago, um, mutations of Dynamin 2, so acquired or somatic mutations of Dynamin 2 were identified in a, uh, a specific type of uh, T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia uh, called early thymocyte progenitor uh, ALL. And here are the mutations that occur within the Dynamin gene, and as you can see, they're sporadic right across uh, the whole uh, gene, suggesting that it probably is either a loss of function or a dominant negative uh, effect. These are heterozygous uh, mutations. And so if we uh, do a GTPase assay, uh, in red here is the, uh, the RBC mutant that we identified, uh, the V235G. You can see that there is, uh, compared to wild type uh, dynamin, there's uh, re significantly reduced GTPase activity. And similarly, a couple of the other mutants which were, have been identified in uh, TALL um, have loss of the GTPase activity. We don't think at this stage that this is the, this is the whole story um, uh, because some, there's some other data which I won't show which doesn't uh, quite fit with it just being a GTPA's uh, null mutant. Anyway, so this is the, um, <clears throat> really the critical experiment is to show that um, uh, the microcytosis is due to impaired iron uptake by the red cell. Uh, so this is uptake by the transferrin receptor. <clears throat> And so if you take bone marrow erythroblasts from uh, heterozygous mice uh, and you um, look at the uptake of transferrin, this is in normal mice, and you can see there is impaired uh, uptake of transferrin receptor in the mutant mice. 
To try and uh, take that a little bit further, what we did was to express the various mutants, um, either um, a, a known GTPA's dead mutant or our mutant uh, in HEC239 cells. Here's the expression data just showing uh, EGFP tag dynamin, either wild type or the mutants. And then we do a transfer and uptake on the HEC293 cells. And you can see that uh, both the V235G um, acts basically just like this, uh, this um, GTPA's dead mutant, uh, indicating that, um, <coughs> that this mutation impairs transferrin uptake. So you can take those uh, overexpressing HEC293 cells, which are GFP tagged, and then look at the endocytosis um, in these cells. <coughs> so this is the uh, snapshot at one minute. Um, so this is really looking at the clathrin uh, mediated uh, or the clathrin part of endocytosis. So this is before dynamin comes in and clips off the endosome. And you can see this is the wild type dynamin expressed in GFP. And here's the 235G expression in one cell but not in another. And you can see that transferrin, here it is, um, sitting uh, within these clathrin uh, pits. Um, and here's clathrin here, nicely surrounding the transferrin. And with the merge, you can see that uh, they're co-localizing really nicely. So it looks like this mutation doesn't affect uh, clathrin uh, binding to the end of, to the uh, the pit. However, when you look at the five-minute snapshot, which is um, about this point, uh, and look at the early endosome uh, formation, so this is a marker of uh, early endosomes, Rad5, and you look at the um, uh, endocytosis at that time point, um, probably. You could just have a look at the V235G. Here's the uh, expression of dynamin. So here's one cell that's expressing it, and here's the other that's not. Now, if you look at transferrin, you don't see any transferrin within the cell that's expressing this mutant. Uh, in contrast, the transferrin's actually on the cells that haven't been transfected. Um, and then if you look at RAB5, again, RAB5 you see um, localizing uh, here, and the only co localization of RAB5 with transferrin and the um, Dynamin is within the cells which weren't transfected, indicating that uh, the problem is, is um, clipping off of the endosome, um, as you'd expect uh, to make early endosomes by dynamin. <coughs> so um, one of the problems is when we did iron studies, which we'd actually done right at the start, because one of the most common causes of small red cells is iron deficiency. Uh, it's probably the most common cause of of microcytosis uh, in human uh, in the world. Uh, but when we did the iron studies, we actually didn't see any uh, abnormal uh, iron. So you can see here uh, the best measure of iron that we use in the clinic is serum ferritin, and the serum ferritins of these mice were completely normal. So we actually didn't think that this was had anything to do with iron uh, metabolism. <coughs> However, when we looked at the red cell ferritin, uh, we could see that there was um, significantly reduced uh, red cell ferritin uh, in these mutant uh, mice. So what we think we've identified is, is a mutation or requirement for dynamin for endocytosis in, specifically into red cells or erythroblasts uh, and not into other cells and probably explaining why the, the ferritin um, is normal serum ferritin. Uh, and just to to prove this, what we did was to take uh, some mutant mice and inject them with uh, intraperitoneal uh, iron and then look three weeks later. And this is the uptake of iron into the body, so this is into the liver, and you can see that iron compared to wild type iron is taken up really nicely in these mutants, and yet the, uh, the red cell phenotype, so the microcytosis, hasn't been corrected by iron. So we think that uh, this is one potential uh, mechanism where we have um, iron-resistant microcytosis, which is actually quite a common thing, and there are lots of families around the world uh, with uh, microcytic anemia that uh, seem to be um, uh, have normal ferritin uh, and not responsive to iron, so they're thought not to have iron deficiency. But we suspect that uh, there are a number of families that may have mutations of dynamin, which may explain uh, this phenotype. Um, so one other uh, piece of evidence to show that it is to do to transferrin uptake of, uh, of transferrin receptor and iron is to cross them with uh, one of the transferrin mutants that we'd actually, receptor mutants that we'd uh, generated. Um, this is the actual transferrin uh, receptor. 
and these are the different mutants that we'd identified all by um, all lying within the transferrin binding uh, surface. Uh, this is just a, a picture of the homozygous mutant showing that uh, if you have homozygosity, you, you have, um, is lethal between 9.5 and 13.5. So when you cross uh, heterozygous Dynamon 2 mutants with heterozygous transferrin mutants, uh, there is reduced numbers of uh, embryos born uh, significantly. Uh, of the double heterozygotes, and the double heterozygotes that do survive have a uh, significantly uh, increased uh, microcytosis compared with um, single heterozygous dynamin or transferrin receptor, indicating that they're, that they probably are functioning in the same pathway, uh, causing um, uh, red cell iron uh, deficiency. <coughs> So this is the, the model that uh, we have is that uh, probably this part of uptake of transferrin in the red cells is normal with clathrin coding, uh, but there's a problem with uh, the dynamin uh, GTPA's dead mutant which can't uh, clip off the enzyme uh, into the red cells. Um, what I might do is uh, skip, oh sorry. Anybody recognise that person? No, we, what I might do is skip the bit uh, regarding TALL, uh, only to say that having this dynamin mutant was then allow us to address what's the role of these dynamin mutations that have been identified in T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. Um, and so what we've done is crossed uh, uh, the dynamin mutants with the LMO2 transgenic mice, which developed this TALL. Here's the survival curve. And when you cross them, uh, the two mice, uh, these double um, um, transgenic mice, uh, have a slightly increased uh, um, incidence and timing of uh, TALL. But what's most dramatic is that uh, the, the phenotype of the TALLs is a much earlier phenotype, suggesting that dynamin is somehow impairing the transition uh, or maturation of these uh, leukemias. And that probably explains why dynamin has been recognised in this early pharmacite progenitor uh, TLL more than in mature TLLs. So I'll move on to the other mutant, which I think uh, probably I think is, is a little bit more interesting. Uh, and this is RBC10. So this, uh, unlike RBC12, which is um, embryonic lethal in the homozygous state, when you cross two heterozygotes, you get a third uh, more severe phenotype, but is viable. Um, here's the uh, homozygous mice, and you can see that they've got a, a much uh, very mild anemia, um, but uh, they've got quite a severe microcytosis. Um, and you can see that, men, that they're uh, present in a Mendelian ratio indicating that uh, this mutation doesn't uh, affect development. Um, this is the red blood cell uh, film of, um, of the homozygous mice, a little bit more dramatic than the RBC12 mice uh, uh, with um, lots of target cells, but also these small uh, dehydrated cells. Uh, and consistent with these target cells, uh, you can do an assay which is called red cell lysis to see how, uh, t uh, how resistant they are to hypertonic shock. Uh, and in these mice, which are in the red, they're more resistant to hypertonic shock, uh, which is consist consistent with the target cells. It doesn't really tell you anything about what the, uh, the disease might be. And there's really a long list of things, if you gave this to a morphologist, that uh, it might be due to, uh, including hemoglobinopathies and iron deficiency. Um, at the time when we did the iron studies, we got normal iron studies, so we didn't think that it was iron deficiency, but uh, as I've mentioned, uh, that doesn't necessarily exclude uh, red cell iron deficiency. Uh, when you look at the red cell membranes, they're completely normal. So we really didn't have much of an idea. Uh, so again, uh, SNP mapping identified uh, a region um, which was about th uh, three megabases. Uh, with a list of about 37 genes, uh, known genes within that region, with nothing that uh, really, really stood out. Uh, so in this case, we used whole genome sequencing to identify the mutation. Uh, and this identified four genes, uh, three of which uh, had, uh, were known SNPs. And so the only gene which uh, had a mutation within the exon was this uh, gene here, uh, uh, which is a solute uh, carrier uh, gene, uh, otherwise known as uh, KCC1 or potassium chloride co-transporter 1. 
Uh, here's the, uh, the DNA mutation, uh, just confirming uh, that the homozygotes had a uh, homozygous mutation. So the mutation in this, uh, in this gene in KCC1 um, is, in with, is within a very conserved uh, part of the cytoplasmic uh, tail of, uh, of uh, this, this protein. This protein hasn't been crystallised um, and uh, it'd be really very difficult because of the transmembrane structure to, to crystallise. Um, so we don't really know exactly where, where this lies in relation to other known regulatory regions. However, it's highly conserved across species and it's conserved uh, within the, the other uh, members of the KCC family except for KCC2. Um, again, just like Dynamon, there's no uh, effect on RNA expression. Uh, unfortunately, there's no antibody that um, is useful for, for measuring KCC1. Uh, we did obtain one, but it, it, it really didn't work. So we, we don't know that uh, the protein is expressed, but I, as I'll show you, it, it uh, almost certainly is. So what are KCCs? KCC1 and 3 are the main regulators of red cell volume. Uh, and this, uh, this is fairly complicated, but I'll, I'll just uh, walk you through. Uh, it, these KCCs are regulated by cell volume. So in response to cell swelling, there is activation of phosphatases, which remove a phosphorylation of specific threonines within the cytoplasmic tail. And that leads to activation of the, uh, the co-transporter. Uh, and passive movement of water out of the cell. So that's how the cell uh, becomes back to normal size. Uh, in contrast, in response to cell shrinkage or dehydration, uh, an enzyme, one of which is a kinase, is probably WINK1, uh, leads to phosphorylation and inactivation of KCCs. Uh, and so uh, you stop pushing water out of the cell and the swell uh, restores uh, its size. Um, and this is just data uh, published from um, a double knockout um, showing the red cell size. And as expected, um, um, if this is important for regulating red cell size, the double knockouts have uh, larger um, red cells, uh, suggesting that it does regulate red cell size. Now, you've got to remember that uh, our mutation um, has small red cells. So this would suggest that this is a gain of function mutation rather than a loss of function mutation. Um, what I might do, and that's in fact what it is, sorry. So to measure KCC, uh, you use rubidium efflux assay. Uh, so this is an assay that uh, Jim Wiley, who's uh, uh, a hematologist uh, who spent probably 40 years um, looking at um, iron transporters uh, in various cell types. Um, so he helped us with this uh, rubidium efflux assay. And essentially, uh, you just load the red cells with um, uh, rubidium and then measure the amount of efflux with time. And you can see when you put the red cells in hypertonic shock, uh, that causes cell swelling and activation of the, uh, of the transporter. So you get increased rubidium. Um, similar effect can be seen when you um, incubate the cells with storosporin. So storosporin is a pan-kinase inhibitor which will inhibit WINK1 and therefore again lead to uh, loss of phosphorylation of this and activation and you can see there's activation in the isotonic uh, um, conditions. In contrast, the hypertonicity can be blocked uh, by uh, Kelly uh, urine A which um, uh, can block the uh, phosphatase activity. So this is sort of the general assays that we use to, to study this, uh, this mutant. So here's the uh, evidence that this mutation is an activating mutation. Um, and really the important thing is to compare this black bar, so that's normal red cells, this is the rubidium efflux, compared to this bar here. So you can see there's about a two-fold increase in rubidium efflux um, in this mutant. Um, this is the response to hypertonic uh, solution. You can see activation of the, of the KCCs, uh, but in contrast, there's really not much activation. So it looks like that this um, mutation has caused basically um, a complete activation uh, of, the, of the receptor, of the, of the transporter. So uh, what's the mechanism of this activation of the, of the co-transporter? 
Uh, well, recently uh, there are two threonines which lie relatively close to this, the mutation, uh, and these are thought to be important uh, phosphorylation sites for regulating KCC and targets of WINK1. Um, and this is just some data uh, from, from this group showing that if you mutate uh, these two threonines to prevent phosphorylation, you get uh, massive uh, upregulation of, uh, of the activation of the co-transporter, indicating that phosphorylation of these sites is, is critical for the, for the regulation of the receptor. So um, what we wanted to do was to see whether this mutation that we'd identified, uh, which lies near the threonines, uh, so here's the mutations here, the two threonines, um, whether they can cooperate or affect um, phosphorylation of those threonines. And here's some data um, overexpressing uh, the mutants in HEC293 cells. Um, here, here's the mutant showing increased um, potassium or rubidium efflux um, compared to the two threonine mutants. And then when you add uh, our mutation to one of the mutants, uh, you basically get a, a maximal activation, suggesting that there is some cooperativity um, uh, where the mutation is preventing phosphorylation uh, of those threonines. So we haven't really uh, nailed it because the antibodies for the specific uh, um, phosphorylation modifications um, aren't really very good. Uh, we've tried a pull down and then blot with a phosphothreonine antibody. Um, and you'd have to maybe trust me that, that this is in wild type, this is the amount of phosphorylation at those threonines um, compared to the mutant. And we think with the eye of sight that, you know, that this is probably um, less than this. Uh, and this is what uh, you see with this double mutant. Uh, so we're trying to confirm this with some mass spec um, uh, with or without SILAC to try and really sh prove that uh, this mutation affects phosphorylation of these uh, two threonines. So the, the uh, model is that uh, somehow these, uh, this mutation is affecting phosphorylation of these uh, two sites and this is leading to activation of KCC uh, with movement of water out of the red cell and then you get small uh, dehydrated red cells. So the, uh, I think from a human side of uh, point of view, this uh, mouse mutant really um, does um, hold a lot of promise. One is that uh, there are a number of families that, where the, a, uh, that have a disease called uh, dehydrated um, hereditary stomatocytosis. So these are called stomatocytes, uh, but essentially they're dehydrated cells similar to our mouse mutant. Uh, and in a number of families, it's been mapped to a, uh, a region which lies within or right next to the KCC1 gene, uh, suggesting that maybe these uh, the, um, families have mutations, activating mutations of KCC1. So in collaboration with uh, a French group, we're currently uh, uh, sequencing a, a number of families for the, for the mutation uh, for KCC1. Um, the other relevance is regarding uh, sickle cell disease. So it's been known for a long time that um, sickle cell uh, red cells have high levels of, uh, of KCC1 activity. Um, here's a rubidium um, influx assay uh, compared to normal red cells. These are the sickle cells. Uh, you can see that there's very high levels of uh, rubidium efflux. And that occurs particularly in uh, dehydrated conditions uh, or in the presence of acidosis. So these these are physiological things which happen uh, to, in patients that, uh, with sickle disease that precipitates crises so that they get um, dehydrated or they get an infection and acidotic. Uh, that tends to precipitate um, uh, dehydration of the cells, which would be consistent with the activation of, uh, of this um, um, co-transporter. Um, and indeed, when you uh, cross the, uh, the KCC mutant mice, uh, with sickle, uh, humanized sickle mice. Uh, this indeed happens if, when you activate the uh, KCC, you get um, um, reduced survival and increased sickling of the, uh, of the mice. So here's uh, the rubidium efflux of red cells. Um, and you can see that sickle mice have uh, slightly higher rubidium efflux just in steady state. But when you cross uh, these sickle mice with the KCC1 uh, mutants, this is wild type KCC1 survival curve. 
uh, compared to the homozygous mutant, essentially they drop dead uh, within three or four weeks of age. And if you look at the blood films, uh, even in the, in the KCC wild type uh, scenario, there's, it's very abnormal, but it's, uh, there's a lot more sickling cells uh, within this. So this really does suggest that um, activation of the KCC is an important uh, pathogenic uh, phenomena that occurs in, in patients with uh, sickle cell disease. So the other uh, aspect is um, with regards to cerebral malaria. So it's been well known that um, hemoglobin S protects uh, uh, from death of cerebral malaria. Uh, and if you uh, superimpose um, areas of sickle trait with malaria, uh, there is, um, particularly in the very high rates of sickle, uh, of malaria, uh, they match up really well suggesting that sickle uh, tray is, a, is an important uh, mechanism or is, is, imp is required or selected for, for malarial resistance. So that's been known for uh, many years. Um, now the mechanism or why those sickle uh, tray red cells are actually resistant to malaria, uh, there are a number of different hypotheses, um, uh, but it's really not, it's still uh, contentious about um, how uh, these red cells are more resistant to malaria. So um, uh, what is remarkable is if you take these red cell mutants and you infect them with malaria, they're completely resistant uh, to cerebral malaria. Um, so this is a, a mouse model of cerebral malaria showing uh, with Bergi eyes showing um, um, complete or so death in the wild type mice uh, and in the mutant mice they're completely resistant. And if you look at the parasitemia levels, uh, of these uh, mice, you can see there's about a 50% reduction, suggesting that increased KCC1 activity may actually be uh, an important mechanism of, of uh, resistance from some cerebral malaria. And that would, uh, may explain um, why these sickle tray um, um, carriers are resistant. Um, it may also explain uh, this um, well uh, described phenomenon of storosporin um, activity. So if you treat uh, uh, red cells with storosporin, it actually reduces the amount of parasitemia within the red cells. And it's always been thought that that, because this is a pan kinase inhibitor, that it's inhibiting some of the malarial um, kinases. Uh, but it is possible uh, that uh, storosporin is actually inhibiting uh, WINK1, uh, which is the kinase which is important for uh, inactivation of, uh, of the KCC. Um, so at the moment we're, we're looking at um, trying to identify some specific inhibitors of WINK1 uh, to use this as a, a, a potential way of targeting to uh, prevent cerebral malaria by altering the KCC activity within red cells of, uh, of, of people. So I think I finished pretty well on time, hopefully. Um, Easily. So uh, hopefully I've uh, just given you a couple of examples where this has illustrated the power of ENU mutagenesis, um, identifying uh, genes which, uh, new genes regulating erythropoiesis, uh, particularly uh, in Dynamin uh, and KCC, um, identifying uh, functional um, regions within those genes and uh, potentially identifying mouse uh, models for human disease. And so I'll just put up Fiona again here, uh, again looking for a postdoc position who's done all this work, um, not, you know, uh, has really been a, a terrific uh, PhD student. Um, and obviously thank uh, Doug and Ben. Uh, I apologise for not publishing, getting more of these papers published, of these red cell mutants. We've got a bucket of them and I think we've only got about three or four papers out of the whole lot yet, so uh, hopefully uh, these two will, will uh, produce really nice papers in the short term. Um, the Dynamon stuff has also been uh, helped by Cedric in my lab and Phil Robinson up in Sydney, who's an expert on Dynamon, and KCC, as I mentioned, Jim Wiley and Simon Foote for the uh, malaria uh, studies. Uh, and finally, thanks to the Viatel Foundation, who's uh, uh, been kind enough to uh, uh, pay my salary for the last few years, uh, as well as the NHMRC except for this year. <laughs> Thanks very much.
play with Terry Speed's video again at the end. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> if I could start. Patients that are presented with chronic unresolved anemia get screened for the diamond gene mutation. Because chronic, no. I mean, chronic, um, you know, unresolved meaning, you know, they've yeah. tried various yeah. treatments. And no, we're, we're collaborating with uh, Mark Fleming in Boston, who's got a number of uh, families <coughs> that have iron resistant microcytic anemia. Uh, so he's uh, sequencing those families for diamond mutations, but it, it's not been recognised before um, uh, that mutations. Interestingly, um, uh, dynamic mutations um, uh, are causes of Shaka Murray tooth um, and central nuclear myopathies. Um, so we've actually got uh, blood counts from, from families with those two diseases and neither of them you can identify in microcytosis. But I guess because of the heterogeneity of humans, uh, it's going to be a lot harder to identify uh, maybe should small changes in red cell size. Um, just, uh, I mean, with the advent of exome sequencing, human work becomes a little more um, straightforward in terms of identifying mutations. Uh, what's been done, I mean, you could perhaps start with humans by simply designing an experiment where you take families, you've got, you know the genetics, or at least you can work that out on exome sequencing, and then you just do blood counts on everyone and you, you match up the traits, you work out yeah. what trait looks to be dominant or even recessively inherited and then go after those. Have those sorts of studies been done in any sort of broad sweeping um, uh, strategy or, I mean, are they just too complicated? I mean, it seems as though it, that might be the way it might turn yeah. next, if, instead of trying to go from the mouse to the human, to just start with the human and, and, yeah. and do a pretty simple test to try and identify these Mendelian traits. Yeah, I guess the problem, as I mentioned, is the het is the heterogeneity of humans that you're just going to get, you know, uh, so many different SNPs. Uh, no, but when you get a phenotype, if you find a phenotype that is clearly tracking sure. genetically, yes. Um, so look, I'm not a geneticist, so I, I'm probably not qualified to answer, other than to say that probably it makes sense that you know there will be a number of families with, you know. Anyway, it's not happening yet. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that the first time that the sickle cell map, where you've got countries like southern Russia, yeah. Pakistan, yeah. which doesn't have malaria, yeah. so what, what other disease is sickle cell separate? Uh, good question. I'm not sure. Uh, and malaria. Used to have malaria. Yeah. Pardon? And malaria. Used to have malaria. Yeah. Used to have malaria. Oh, okay. Right. You used to have malaria. <laughs> malaria! <laughs> Okay. Uh, you mentioned before how it's kind of strange that SJLs have mm. uh, some things. And they some tend things. to get macrocytosis, yeah. Any, any theory on why? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. So given that this, <coughs> this is a sort of a dominant screen and you have a big sort of uh, genetic background, you can get different sets of genes there. Yeah, I think I think it probably is strain dependent, uh, and obviously you know the recessive mutants. We've done looked at a few recessive mutants, uh, but they're a lot harder to to generate. Is KCC1 protective, the mutation protected as a HET rather than as a homozygote? And I guess the yeah. thing I'm wondering about is, is how does the protection compare to a sickle allele? And why aren't there other alleles that are just as frequent as? As, yeah, as we, we haven't looked in the heterozygous state. Um, uh, the, the heterozygotes do have increased uh, activity, so the rubidium's high, um, and uh, we're doing that at the moment. Um, 
but no, it gets in, but they can't seem to replicate very well. So the parasite number within the red cells is reduced as well. So, I mean, I, I'm yeah. I, I presume that it's to do with the intracellular potassium levels that are important for replication, but I don't know. There might be. Can you answer this one? Yep. Yeah, so we, we know a little bit that the parasite actually activates um, some anion channels in the red blood cell membrane. I'm wondering if KCC might be the channel. I don't think at the moment we really know what host side. We, we know a couple of parasite proteins that go to the surface and seem to switch this thing to activate it. Right. That could be that um, those experiments need to be done. So are there people, are there humans that you know of that we could get red blood cells where they have this mutation? Uh, and we can infect them. <laughs> the red blood cells, not the people. Uh, no. <laughs> no. So we, we can't get some red cells with some human red cells with this mutation. No. Yes. Uh, no, unfortunately, not been any. So other KCCs have been, uh, there are humans with KCC um, uh, mutations, but not KCC1. Yes. Yeah. Um, would you care to speculate a little more about why the dynamin mutations are involved in the T cell leukemia? Um, we think that it's, it um, impairs the transition um, that's required for T cell receptor, pre T cell, cell, cell receptor alpha uh, signaling. That's one possibility that it just impairs the differentiation and you get a build up of those self renewing cells. So there's a larger pool. Is it to of, do with vesicle formation somehow? Yes. I'm trying to tie the two stories together. Yes. Um, we, we haven't looked at that at the moment, but. Uh, it's well known that, that you do need endocytosis for, for that signalling to, to occur. The other possibility is that some um, receptor signalling actually requires endocytosis to switch it off. Um, so it's possible that uh, IL-7 or notch uh, that's stuck at the membrane uh, may actually have enhanced signalling. But at the moment, when we've looked at these uh, T cells that have the mutation, they don't seem to have high levels of notch signaling or IL-7 signaling. So uh, I think that's less likely. And um, has it been observed as being or can we get it in, um, say, lethal uh, I don't think diamond's been identified as a uh, it's mutant. Something general about yeah. Do you think there's yes. more? Um, There'd be more kind of disease. Yes, that's true. But I, I, it's not, uh, as far as I'm aware, it's not been identified in, in B cell malignancies. Seems to be specific for T cells. Huh? 